James Haggerty, welcome to the Live Long and Master Aging podcast. Thank you. Pleased to be here. It's really good to talk to you. We uh, focus very much on the living here and telling people's stories as they relate to their health and, and their longevity. So it might seem a little curious that we're going to focus here on obituaries, but uh, maybe it isn't so curious and unusual because what I get certainly from your book is that we live lives and we experience a long running story that is worth telling. And my sense is that just the process of telling the story can be life enhancing for the person writing the story. Definitely. Yeah. As, as an obituary writer, uh, I'm always struck uh, by the reactions of uh, family members when somebody dies. I, I often talk to the adult children of people who have died, and they're so eager to have that story preserved, but often they know so little about that story. Um, and so that made me think, People really have to, you know, take the narrative into their own hands and start telling their story when they're young, and keep telling it and and find ways to preserve the most important parts of their story. What is the difference between telling your own story that is meant as an obituary, as opposed to an autobiography? I guess the difference is the publication date. One is oftentimes published while you're still alive, an obituary clearly is once you've died. Right. Yeah. I think the word obituary is a problem here because people have, have uh, most people have the idea that the obituary is just a short note that has a few names and dates and achievements and maybe a flowery quote from somebody and then details about the funeral service. Uh, but that's not what I have in mind when I try when I say, let's preserve your life story. Uh, I think people should just think of it as I want to save some of my best stories, the ones that will be meaningful to my friends and family and maybe my grandchildren and great grandchildren, rather than thinking I'm going to write my obituary. Now, if you do that, certainly some of those stories might find a place in a well-written obituary someday. But I don't think people should really worry about the obituary. I think they should worry about what do I want to be remembered about me? What, what do I want people to understand about me? Uh, what did I go through here on earth and why and what did I learn from it? Well, we're going to delve into that in a second. Uh, maybe we could start this by, as you say in your book, let's start at the beginning and, and maybe tell me a little bit about yourself and how you came to specialize in, in this area of storytelling. Sure. Well, I've been a journalist since I was about five years old. Uh, uh, and I had my own neighborhood papers. So I've always been a journalist. And uh, I began my professional career when I was in college. Uh, I joined the Wall Street Journal full time at age 22. And I've now been there for more than 40 years. Uh, and at the beginning of my career, if somebody had told me you're going to be an obituary writer, I would have said, oh, no, because obituaries were thought to be, oh, this is something that you give to somebody who's just been hired or somebody who's uh, too too old and tired to do anything serious. Um, and I always thought of obituaries just as a brief note. Uh, but when I was based in London uh, in the 80s and then again in the early 2000s, I, I noticed that I was reading obituaries in some of the British papers about people I'd never heard of. And I found these stories so interesting that I wanted to go back to them every day. And I, I began to think, you know, obituaries are really interesting. They're history, and they've they've got lessons about what people went through. They're often very inspiring. They're often amusing. They should be amusing. Uh, and I thought, you know, one day I wouldn't, wouldn't mind doing this. Uh, at the time, the Wall Street Journal wasn't at all interested in obituaries, but eventually, they came around. And about eight years ago, they said they asked if anybody on the staff wanted to write obituaries full time. And I think out of over a thousand journalists, only two people volunteered. I was one of them. Um, and I got the job. Uh, that was seven years ago that I started. I've probably written 900 or more obituaries since then. And it's really the best job I've ever had. It's fascinating to me because in my, my day job, 
for the BBC, I, I often have to do obituaries, uh, broadcast obituaries. These are not long form written obituaries. And very mm. often it's something that you have to, uh, to use the term, you've got to turn the story around pretty quickly. Maybe I have mm. a couple of hours in terms of, of the deadline. So it's, it's a lot of fast work. And oftentimes my frustration is that once getting into it, I wish I'd had months to really delve into that person's lifestyle to talk about to, to talk to their friends to talk to the people that really knew them the, the time in broadcasting just doesn't allow you that but it seems to me yeah, to do right. the job properly and you've kind of indicated this to do the job properly you really need to to nurture the, the script and really get under the skin of that person yes every time i read an obituary I, a i wish i had more time to do research but b i really wish i could talk to this person now on rare occasions i actually have uh, but usually I haven't. And so I'm relying on what friends say, what family members say, interviews that they may have given, uh, any scrap of information I can find. Uh, but I'm in way better shape when people have written down something or recorded an oral history, because that's where they try to explain themselves and they know much better than anybody else. So how do we approach that process? You go into this in quite some detail in the book, and obviously starting from the beginning. My first thought was writing my own story. Am I going to be inclined to kind of sugarcoat it, to, to skirt around the bits that weren't particularly pleasant or memorable about my life? Well, you might, but I don't think you would. You know, what I find is that more people than you would expect actually do write their life stories, often just for the benefit of their family and a few friends, perhaps, uh, and themselves. Uh, and quite often, they are much more frank about the mistakes they've made than family members or friends are. You know, when somebody dies, it's our natural instinct. We want to say nice things about them. That's part of the grieving process. And a lot of people think, well, an obituary should just be a tribute or a eulogy. Uh, and there's a place for tributes and eulogies, but that's not a life story. That's not really the essence of the person, usually. Um, and they all sound quite a bit the same. Uh, you know, if you read obituaries, they were all devoted to their family. And, uh, they were all uh, kind and generous and wise. Um, and usually life is a bit more complicated than that. And most people, I think, are willing to admit that most people... I think are almost eager to talk about some of the mistakes they made, maybe not all of them, but some of them and what they learned from them, because they see that, you know, this could be helpful to my children, my grandchildren, to anybody. Some people, I suspect, might say, uh, at least approaching this process, they might say, well, I don't really have a story to tell. I I'm just an ordinary person. I I've lived my life. I'm not famous. I'm not infamous. And therefore, right. what should I write about? Right. That is a huge stumbling block for people. Uh, what I would say is uh, Samuel Pepys wasn't famous. Uh, Anne Frank wasn't famous. Uh, we're lucky that they saw fit to write down a few things they observed in their lives. Uh, and everybody has interesting stories to tell. Uh, some may be more interesting than others. I mean, some people might need a long book to describe their life. Other people may find just a few pages but whatever you can put down will be useful. Uh, I think starting with, to start with, it will be useful to yourself to look back and, and think about what you did and why and how it turned out. It's especially useful if you start that when you're young and, and repeat the process regularly because it helps you have a sense of whether you're really on the right path to achieving what you want to achieve. Um, and you, it gives you an incentive to try to improve the narrative. Uh, I know when I, I sketched out an obituary for myself as part of writing this book, and I thought, gee, um, I'm going to have to do a few more good deeds because I want to ha have more of those to talk about, uh, along with all of the mistakes I made. And you say start young, uh, and, and that to me seems obvious that you want to try to capture those memories and then work on it throughout your life. But mm -hmm. in reality, practically speaking, how many younger people are inclined to do this when you, you're at that stage in your life when you think everything is ahead of you? Yeah, I think I think you can do it. Uh, in my case, uh, when I was uh, going away from home to work, uh, my mom told me, civilized people write home once a week. And so I wrote home once a week, uh, every day, every 
week for over 30 years. So I've got a, a quite a bit of a record there of what I did. Uh, today, people don't write many letters, but they do put a lot of stuff on social media. And it seems to me that if you saved the best of your postings uh, and got rid of 98% of them, which are just trivia, uh, those would be valuable records to have for yourself and for others. You know, the, when you post something about something important that happened to you, uh, not just what you ate for lunch, but, uh, you know, how you finally decided what you were going to major in in college or when you got your first job or when you lost your first job, uh, any kind of interesting life experience that you find yourself explaining to your friends, uh, it's good to keep a copy of that for yourselves and put it in a little file called Life Story or My Life. Uh, save it for later. Those things add up. It's interesting, isn't it, how times have changed. Uh, when I read in your book about writing letters uh, when you were younger, uh, it's exactly what I did with my parents. I moved away from home and I wrote letters and it would come with a stamp on every week from my mum. And I would read it and I kept those letters. Times have changed. You mentioned really social media has replaced that. I'm just wondering whether people are more or less inclined to share certain things about themselves in new media. Clearly, the audience is wider for social media. And perhaps, although some people are very open about what they say, others might yeah. not be inclined to share the kind of thoughts that they might have put down using pen and paper. And also the other element to this, of course, is a personal diary, something that isn't published or even shared with anyone else during your life. Clearly, that's going to be a, a big resource. Right. Well, I think uh, on social media, people are pretty used to sharing a lot, uh, very often too much. Uh, not everybody, but many people. Um, and I'd say to people, you know, share what you feel comfortable sharing. Uh, and you can supplement that. You could write some extra notes about, you know, what you really thought or some of the more disturbing things you had to go through. Uh, but it's good to save that. You know, it, it becomes a kind of a journal or diary. You can also do a journal or diary, but that takes quite a bit of uh, discipline and not too many people will keep that up. If you saved a, a few stories a year about things that happened to you, that would be very valuable. Is this, do you find, uh, almost a therapeutic process for some people? Uh, that clearly the, the the end goal is is to leave something about your life, but you're still living. And I, I'm just wondering if it's almost cathartic for some people to to write about and to relive some of those experiences and actually enhance your life while you're living. Definitely. I mean, there, there's been quite a bit of psychological research about people writing down stories about themselves, particularly about bad things that happened. And the findings were that usually afterwards, people felt better about it. They felt better about themselves. They felt better in general. Uh, and I think it's probably partly because uh, in thinking about things that went wrong uh, and sorting them out into an explanation, you can so sometimes sort of put away some of the pain and resentment and understand, well, it happened uh, it wasn't all my fault. Uh, it wasn't all anybody's fault. Uh, and here's what I learned from it. And then you kind of gone through a healing process. So, you know, I don't think there's any magical about it, but I think it is helpful uh, to think about what you've done and why and what you should maybe be doing differently. I guess, James, the other, or perhaps even the main benefit of this is other people. It's your relatives, it's your descendants, maybe even descendants that you're not aware of while you're alive. It's it's leaving your story. To what extent does a work like this benefit other people? What do they get out of it? Well, I think partly they get out of it just an understanding of where they came from and uh, what their, for instance, what their parents uh, were doing with their lives. Uh, I realized this after my dad died because we wrote an obituary about him and it was accurate. It, it summarized the jobs he'd held, the awards he'd won, the survivors, uh, the names and dates. But we, sh we didn't reflect anything about his personality, uh, which I would like to remember and which maybe his grandchildren would like to know because they never met him. Uh, and we didn't even explain why he became a journalist. Uh, 
which is a pretty important question for me. Uh, and I, I, I kick myself for not asking him that. Um, and I find it's very common when I talk to children, adult children of people who have died, they really have no idea why mom or dad chose a particular path. They just have accepted that as a given. To me, that's interesting. Uh, uh, a life story shouldn't be just what you have done. It should be why and how. Those are the interesting parts of the story to me. What advice do you give to people? And clearly, as a journalist, you're used to doing this. You're used to asking the questions of people who are, are very close to others to learn more about their lives. But when it's within your own family, I can see that for some people that could be perhaps a little awkward that they want to raise the subject, maybe subjects that they've never raised with those people who are very close to them. But there, there are issues that are clearly relevant to their lives and they, and they want to delve into them. That's a very good point. I mean, uh, as a journalist, I'm so used to asking people questions. <laughs> I ask questions of everybody I meet. I think I drive a lot of them crazy. Uh, but I know how to ask questions. And most people don't really know how to ask questions in a sense of interviewing somebody. And so a lot of people will sit down with mom or dad at some point and say, I'm going to ask you some questions. We're going to record this. And that's a great idea. The problem is, they ask a question, they get the answer, and then they just move on to the next question. But a journalist knows that if you ask somebody a question, they rarely answer it completely on, on the first attempt, and often they completely talk around it. So you need to come back and say, well, yes, but uh, exactly why did you do that? And could you explain a little bit more clearly this and that? Uh, and so it takes a little bit of patience and learning about interviewing techniques, which I do discuss in my book. Um, another problem is that people often will make a recording, but then they'll just put it in a drawer somewhere. And 30 or 40 years ago from now, it's on some device that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it, it can't be used. So people should think ahead. And when they make a recording, uh, make a transcript of it right away. And then go through that transcript and annotated, put in the explanations that will be needed for people reading it 20 or 30 years from now. Because, you know, you might mention Bill or Joe, uh, and you and dad know who Bill and Joe are, of course, but your great-grandchildren will not know who they are. You've uh, hit a nerve there, because I'm in a, a studio surrounded by cassettes, and I've even got some old uh, quarter-inch reel-to-reel tape recordings mm -hmm. of the interviews I've done during my long career. And it, it's a real issue, isn't it, that the technology mm -hmm. is changing so quickly. And, and even if you have something as, a, let's say, an MP3 file uh, on a computer, it's corruptible. And so absolutely, mm -hmm. I, I, I totally agree with you about getting a, a transcript and, and getting it immediately to, to save those words. One thing that intrigues me is I wonder if some people find out things that they perhaps didn't want to know, things that are upsetting, things that are, are negative, that are maybe, yes, part of the story, but they would have rather left that on a shelf somewhere and uh, not had to deal with it. Does it, can it actually create more problems than it resolves in, in that interview process? I think there is a risk of that. Uh, and if you're telling your own life story, you have to be aware of that, that uh, how, how will this affect other people, if I reveal it. Um, and sometimes discretion is uh, the better part of valor. Uh, and sometimes, but usually there are ways to admit to mistakes or talk about bad things that happen without really pointing the figure, finger at anybody else or without revealing names or places that might cause problems. But just admitting what you got wrong, what you learned from it. Uh, you tell as much or as little as you want, but it's something to think about. And I think it's especially important to think about it if there are things that uh, you believe your family or friends may not understand about you or uh, things that they should understand better about you, uh, things that could trouble them if they don't know more of the story. And is but this, I don't think uh, nobody should feel obliged to reveal everything. And is it a process, clearly 
this is going to appeal to people who have lived a, a significant chunk of their lives and have stories to tell. Is it a process that you would advise people to complete and basically put a full stop, final chapter, that is it? But then obviously they're going to continue living and we don't know how long we're going to continue living for but i think there's maybe a human nature in us that wants to complete the project even though the life isn't complete right yeah i, I think it's never complete but sometimes people do uh they want to make a book quite a few people will privately publish something and of course that's not going to be complete but maybe it'll be mostly complete maybe you do that and then you supplement it you put in a few more pages later on a few more notes uh, when my mom was 79 years old, I sat her down and we talked for several hours and uh, I asked her a lot of questions and I wrote her life story in about 25 or 30 pages. I did it for her because I knew she wasn't going to do it, although she was happy to talk to me. And I figured she's 79 years old, you know, it's time. H how much more can really happen to her? Well, my mom's now 96 and a lot more happened to her. <laughs> Very surprising things happened to her. It resulted in her appearing on television and getting the book contract. Um, and so I just have to supplement her story a bit. But I'm glad I sat down with her at 79 and got the first 79 years anyway. I'm wondering, from your career in terms of writing obituaries and, and also this project, did something surprise you as you were doing the research for this book? Were you struck by something that is beneficial from this process that you hadn't realized? You've been doing sort of journalistic obituaries, formal obituaries to be published in newspapers, but you're, you're widening out that idea and, and that skill for, for everyone here. Was there something that occurred to you during the process that you hadn't realized before? Well, two things uh, have occurred to me since I became an obituary writer. Uh, well, three things I guess I would say. First thing we mentioned was how little people know about family members and close friends often. The second thing is this possibility that by thinking about your what's happened in your life periodically, uh, instead of waiting until you're on your deathbed, you could actually improve your life. Uh, and the third thing is... Uh, that people very often want to talk about things that you might think are too sensitive. Um, because when I write obituaries, um, I'm often dealing with a public relations person to try to find a family member. And the, the public relations person almost always says, well, Mr. Haggerty, you understand the family is grieving and they need some space and some time. And I said, I know they're grieving, but please just tell them that I've requested to talk with them. I would welcome that opportunity. And more than nine times out of 10, they do want to talk to me. And they seem to find it therapeutic. Uh, they want to make sure that the story is as accurate as possible, for one thing. Um, and they just want to talk about their loved one. And that made me realize that I've been handling grieving people in general in the wrong way. I always used to think, you know, if a a friend's father or mother had died or spouse had died. The next time I saw that person, I didn't want to bring that up because I thought, oh, it's, I don't want to reopen those wounds. But often that's exactly what they do want to talk about. They want to talk about the person they've lost. And so I think we have to be open to that uh, without being intrusive, but just not be afraid to ask about somebody who's departed. I've found exactly the same thing. I'm based in Los Angeles, oftentimes have to talk to Hollywood figures about other Hollywood figures who have uh, recently died. And you find yourself talking to people who during normal times you would never get even close to in terms of doing an interview. But for exactly the reasons that you describe, people are keen to talk about their friends, their, their loved ones, people that were close to them, people who meant a lot to them during their lives. The other thing I've noticed that's changed dramatically in, in recent years, and we've talked about social media, is the, and this probably proves your point, and that is the inclination of people to go straight onto social media within minutes sometimes mm -hmm. of the death of mm -hmm. an individual being announced. Right. They want to pay tribute. So you find yourself getting a, a, a musician or a, a, an actor who's just died, and their very closest collaborators 
are out there with the the long, very intimate, sometimes recollections of, of what that person was like. Right. Yeah, we just had an example of that with David Crosby. Me too. Uh, yeah. Social media lit up with stories about him from famous people. Yeah. Uh, going back to the point that you made about uh, this process enhancing our lives, so literally just writing about our lives, talking to others about our lives, that particularly interests me with this podcast. This is a podcast about living. It's it's not a podcast about, about death. It's a mm. podcast about enhancing life, physical, mental life, and, and extending what we call health span or healthy lifespan, so living as long as we can with our physical health, our mental capacity. And it occurs to me that what you're talking about could actually encourage us to think about the time that we have left in a different way and perhaps a more positive way. If we've maybe reconciled some of the issues from our past and discussed them and and found out more, that we might approach what's left of our lives in a slightly different way. Yeah, I think... uh... I mean, there's so many ways that you can enhance uh, your later years. Uh, But one of them, I think, is by thinking about your life and uh, finding ways to share lessons with other people uh, and uh, realizing that things are still happening to you that are of interest. Uh, The the fact that you're dealing with aging uh, means that you're having new experiences every day. Uh, and actually, it wouldn't hurt to talk about those a little bit. Uh, younger people could learn from those. And more generally, often a question that, that I ask people during these interviews, in terms of your own longevity, so looking forward in your life, is it something that you actually think about what your life will be like in 10 years' time, maybe a couple of decades' time? And... Does your work help you think about that? Do you have a certain vision of what it will be like in a few decades' time to be living your life? I do think about that. Uh, I think about uh, how I will pass spend my time. Uh, I'm really a workaholic uh, and have been for forever. Um, and But I now think more about how I can... Uh, gradually uh, transition to a period where I won't be working as much and I shouldn't be working as much because my abilities, uh, some of my abilities are going to decline and my energy will decline. So I have to think of ways to stay engaged without necessarily working 50 or 60 hours a week. Um, And I do think that my sort of vocation and hobby of asking people about their lives and writing about their lives, and also asking myself about my life and writing about it, uh, that these are things that I can continue to do uh, that will be useful for me and perhaps for a few others as well. We are lucky enough, we're privileged enough to be doing a job where it is actually quite easy to keep on going. There, there isn't, I mean, clearly there's a, a certain element of physical stamina, but uh, a lot of this is actually quite easy just to keep on going, providing there are the hours in the day. Yeah, I think you, you can go a long, t- long time as a journalist. My mom is 96 years old. She's still writing two newspaper columns a week in North Dakota. So she shows that uh, the fact that she has stayed active, although at a uh, somewhat slower pace, I think has really helped her in her old age because she stayed very connected with a lot of people. And she has a mission every day when she gets up. What response have you had from people since you published this book? Clearly, many people are aware of the kind of work that you do, but just opening this door, opening this window of opportunity, as as you do to a lot of people, explaining the value of personal stories, what response have you had? Uh, Very positive. Uh, I think it's remarkable how many people uh, have thought about telling their stories, want to do it. Many have tried. Some are still just thinking about it. But a lot of people want to know more about it and want to know how they could do it better. And you notice in the market uh, place, there are an ever increasing number of programs and apps and services that will help you tell your life story. So obviously, entrepreneurs have seen this as a big growth area. Uh, and they've noticed that 
some tech, some modern technology actually makes it easier. So I, th I think overall that's a positive thing. You can get an app that will send you or your loved one a question every week, and, and they answer the question about their life, and then this can be assembled into a book. Uh, that could be a good thing for somebody who needs a prompt. And there are many other types of services, uh, anything you can imagine almost to help you. Uh, or you can do it yourself, you know, follow my methods. But uh, and for everybody, it's going to work a little bit differently. So I don't think there's a formula for it. I think it's something that people should think about, you know, how, what do I want to save? How, how do I want to, what, what from my life story do I want to save? Now, just as you write a will to determine what will happen to your money after you die, you should think about, well, what will happen to my best stories? You know, I can't leave them to my son to tell because he's going to get half the details wrong. So if I want to save this story, I better write it down or record it. Well, James, I think it's a fascinating area. Thoroughly enjoyed your book. I hope it does inspire lots of people to do exactly what we've been talking about. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. 